Yeah, for those who, who thought that I may be a lady, I'm not a lady. I, I'm, a, I'm originally sort of Dutch, my ancestors, and, uh, and, and they went over to, with their little ships to South Africa, and this is where I was born. Spent most of my life there, and I've been in the UK now for four years. Um, I've worked in uh, petrochemical industry for many years, and all the refractory related issues with that. Now I'm exposed to slightly a bigger variety of refractories, from glass to cement kilns to um, uh, incinerators and so forth. Um, when I started with this with this topic, I thought it's an easy topic, you know, sort of, um, you know, how to get the most out of the refractories. This is what we try to do every single day. And then I started realizing the further I compiled this this uh, presentation is that it's not it's not really that easy. It it's every single unit or or refractory vessel has basically got its own requirements. And um, and what I'm going to show you today is is most probably things you haven't seen and would not wish to see in any case, because I believe that from where you're sitting, you're more more likely to be interested in things like tun tunnel kilns and refractory linings on, on those, and I'm quite sure you don't have the same problems as in other parts of the industry. So, to start off with, I will show you a few nasties. Things that, uh, that we encounter in the refractory world, and, um, and this is where people went about trying to reach the limits of their refractory lining. So, so it's actually, you know, revving your car into the red and, and, um, and the pistons came through the, the bonnet. And there's just a few images showing, you know, refractory failures. Now, refractory failures is, I suppose, the part where you we have actually exceeded the limits of the refractory line. Um, refractory failures, uh, failures uh, obviously causes reduction loss, um, penalties for late delivery, additional maintenance <coughs> costs, and safety risk. So it's not something that you'd like to have, it's something that you really would like to avoid. Um, and most people only realize what the limits of the refractory linings are once they've seen or experienced the failure. So how do we try and go about saving all this money that we lose? We go back to our question, how to get the best without running the risk of failure? I would say that the first thing is to know the conditions under which the lining has to operate. We found in many cases that people don't really understand their own processes. They don't understand what to tell the refractory supplier what is needed of the refractory that they would like to have. They actually expect the refractory supplier to understand their process. And in many cases they don't because they're in a total different field. They put they could put raw materials together and they and they hope it's going to work. Um, and one of the, the main things are, if you give a specification out for, for bricks, you need to know what, what the refractory is going to, <coughs> what it's going to withstand. Also, you need to know the requirements of the structural design. Sometimes these refractory units has got much more than just you know a brick that needs to to be able to handle high temperatures. It also needs to be structurally sound. I mean, you've got like huge vessels, um, large stresses on, on, on the refractory bricks itself, um, which actually increases or decreases as you heat it up. So it actually changes, and you need to know what happens to this this whole structure when it's built when it dries out, and when you fire it up again. 
you need to know the limits of the refractory material. Now, how would you know this? I mean, you're surely not refractory experts and all that, but you would most probably ask a refractory supplier, you know, what is the, what's the limits of your material? Or you would take a data sheet and you'd look at the data sheet and say, well, hey, this, is a, this, this material is rated as a 1600 material, 600 degrees centigrade material, or this material has got a 50 MPa cold crushing strength, or this has got a density of this, and so forth. And, and you would make some sort of assumptions from, from that. And depending on your experience, you could make either good assumptions or, or not as good assumptions. So, in many cases, it is actually required in these discussions with a refractory supplier that he needs to understand, that you need to understand that, that the material that he's prescribing to you is actually going to meet all the, you know, those two above criteria. That it will actually survive your process conditions and that it will be structurally sound. And then, the last one that I would say is ensure proper installation. I think that's a. I'm going to. Sh I'm going to show you an example of of an installation that went wrong, and there's many installations that goes wrong. There's not only one. Installation problems are mostly quite obvious. You have a hot spot. You go in. You can see. Well, you know, there's a definite problem with the way that they've either put this brick in or cast this castable or spray this gunning material or so forth, and therefore. We at SRAM don't often see this type of failures because it's obvious, people can see it themselves. But it is something that happens quite frequently in the industry. Now, to demonstrate you know, how you go about sort of looking at your vessel itself, uh, we're going to use an example of a multiple earth calciner or so forth. Now, this is, I suppose, this is the, the mother of all of all refractory units. I think it's the unit which, um, which has the biggest complexity in terms of structural design than anything because you've got these hearts, you've got an outside sort of cylinder and you've got these hearts that actually stays there on its own. Now if you think about just a normal civil building then you can build it and it will stay there. But this thing actually eats up it's got different temperatures at different levels. You've got material coming down and gas, hot gas moving up. So you've got quite a complex system there. There's a, a image of a photo of the underside of one of these hearths. So you can see it's actually just refractory. There's no metal in it, nothing like this. It's just standing by itself. In the cool state, you will find that you know, the material has actually got cracks in it because once it's expanded and it, and it cools down again and it contracts, then it doesn't go exactly to the same places. So when it's nearly built, you won't see this. When, uh, when you cool it down, you will see it. Now, you imagine this whole tons of material just hanging there on its own. There, there's, just to give you an idea of, of what it looks like, you've got steel shell on this side, You've got like a skew bag, and then a, a range of bricks, some of them actually forming these, these portals there, and then the rest of the arc. And the intermediate arcs are just shorter, so, so the material actually falls on this, runs down there. When it gets to this one, it falls down there and runs down and goes to those port, ports, um, or drop holes. Now, one of the things that we do to understand this better is to do um, finite element analysis on it. Now, this is just a finite element analysis of the temperature distribution. And you can see that the majority of the of the earth is actually at quite a uniform temperature, but that you have quite a bit of temperature differences here at the, at the, at the shell side. And this is exactly where your drop holes are. In this area, yeah. So you need to be quite careful of how you design and, and select the materials for this section. Again, using 
finite ele element analysis, we can we can put some data in there of, of materials and uh, and calculate what is the stresses in those in those areas, both in terms of radial and both in terms of loop, and this gives us an idea of what we're working with. Now it's not very very accurate, but it gives us a very good in indication of at least what we are dealing with. Um, one way to to ensure that we've got the right properties is to actually test it ourselves. So this type of this type of data you would rarely find on a data sheet. And and therefore it is so understanding your process, understanding the structural limits of or the structural needs of your of your refractory, you can now go about and test some refractory materials and see how it would actually fit into that part. Now this is a compressor strain stress strain analysis using an instron at uh, a temperature and it works basically like this. You've got a little specimen in there with a hole in and you and you just you just crush it like this and you actually measure the deformation of this of this block as it uh, as it squeezes down. And that gives you a graph that looks something like this. So what we have here is now for different temperatures, a specific material at different temperatures, and you can see how it changes characteristics by the temperature that it's been exposed to. So for instance, we have a very nice solid line up there uh, around 500 degrees centigrade. So this means that I can press this very, very hard and it's not going to move, it's not going to deform a lot, it's really very, very stiff. At a thousand degrees, so at a thousand degrees, it actually lowers quite a bit. So from 500 to a thousand, there's quite a big drop. And, but you can see one thing that definitely changes is that the deformation of it quite quite dramatically increases. So so it's more pliable. At 1,250 degrees, only 250 degrees higher, which is not a lot, it even drips, drops further. So so now it's it's really like quite flexible. And at 1,500 degrees again, another 250 degrees up, you, you get something like this. Now not all materials behave the same, and I think this is, this is what, what I try to, will try to show you the next slide, is that when we test bricks of the same sort of group, so, so you would get from a supplier, you would get, you can use this one, this one, this one, or this one, and you have a selection in front of you, and you've got to decide which one it is that's going to fit this, this unit of your the best. And this is what you can actually get, and this is real data of four different bricks suggested for this specific application. And you can see the difference between them at a specific temperature. So there's not different temperatures, same temperature, just different materials. Now if I have this data, which, which one I'm which, um, which one am I going to choose um, for, for that specific application? And again, uh, we'll be using our finite element analysis to get an idea of where the stresses are. And we have found that the stresses are quite low, lower than 10, so we zoom in onto this, uh, onto the lower part of it. And this is just the same materials, we're just looking now at the scale of 0 to 10, and what we have here is now the three, well these two are actually on the same line, so we have two bricks here that's very similar, another one there and another one there. <coughs> so if we look at the stresses that could develop in the lining, and the amount of deformation associated with it for the different materials, we have now a better understanding of which one could be the better one. This one, the disadvantage of this one, would for instance be that for this specific stress it could deform too much. So that means that the art can actually drop. These ones are very rigid and very strong, but this actually means that the art can be under quite extreme pressure because it doesn't deform enough. So the one in the middle is, for this specific application, a better 
choice because it's got good strength, but it also has got a, a little bit of deformation ability that gives you some sort of uh, lowering of your stresses when, when, when the heart is in expanded. So this type of information is not something that you would just find on a data sheet. It actually needs slightly more involvement in an analysis to determine the pay based material. <coughs> now from this example it's clear that a good understanding of the station in the line determines the type of bricks to be used. Um, and it also indicates that bricks suggested by different supplies varies largely and that careful selection is required. So just to give you some sort of an impression that refractory choices are not always so simple. The other aspect I'd like to demonstrate with an example is um, proper installation. Now in this specific case we had a tube sheet um, and the tube sheet is it's basically a, a, a piece of protective refractory just before a, a heat exchanger. So you've got hot gas coming from one side and it goes through a heat exchanger. And this is just to ensure that the tube sheet, the steel part of the tube sheet is, uh, is protected from, from the intensity on the one side. So once it goes into the tubes, it's just steel tubes and there's water on the other side. And what will, what will happen is it will exchange the heat and the water on the outside would keep the steel cool enough so that that's not a problem. But on the tube sheet itself, you've got a bit of a problem. You need to protect it in some way. <coughs> now, in this specific case, it was done in a very um, uh, warm area. So we had temperatures of in excess of 40 degrees centigrade there. Now, this always complicates installation of refractories. The, the environmental conditions. So what we've used for this is we've used the self-leveling material. So that means it flows easier between all this, you know, all the shapes. You can imagine that the refractory material now actually have to move in between all these little tubes. And so we've used the self-flow material. Um, we've added ice to the mixing water to try and slow down the, the chemical reaction. We've actually gone as far as installing a air condition inside the unit to keep the ambient temperature there sort of lower so that again we, we buy some time so the material have a longer setting time. We've reduced the mixing batches so instead of having a large batch we've just used smaller batches and um, and this means that we have a little bit more working time on the material. Once material stands outside in the, in, in the heat it can actually start setting on you making flowability more difficult. And we've also cast it in smaller casting strips. So, so everything was done, you know, quite to the books. However, the thermocouples installed between the, the steel and uh, the refractory lining indicated uh, high temperatures, which, which indicated gas trap. And, uh, and when we demolished it, we actually found uh, you know, paths of gas tracking. You can see, you can see actually how horrible this lining was once we've taken it apart. So there's actually gaps almost as big as my finger going through there. And, and, and you would thought, well, what on earth went wrong here? And it was only by watching the actual installation process that we realized what was the problem. So this was a picture of, you know, how they put these ceramic ferrules in the tubes and then they cast they've got a, a shutter here there, and then you cast them on the top and, and then it just flows in between all these um, ceramic ferrules what we didn't realize at that specific point was that these ferrules because they were made of of a porous um, ceramic material they were actually absorbing quite a bit of this water from the castor oil. And, and so that means that the flowability of this material tremendously decreased. Um, 
And the solution was actually easy. We just dipped the, the funnels into water. So, so it wasn't so... It was already saturated with water before we installed. Um, so again, it, it sometimes... Installation may seem like a simple task, but it could actually be a very important part in getting your unit uh, in a proper operating condition. So we must use best insulation practice. Insulation is a very important component in achieving good results from a refractory lining. So again, how do you get the best out of your refractory lining? Yes, you try and install it as best as possible, because otherwise you won't succeed in that. Um, the quality of installation can be subjected to personal experience and opinion. What I'd like to say is, is that different people have different ideas of what the quality installation is. Um, and, and the best is actually to have somebody with an understanding of what the end result should be in order to get the proper installation. Knowing what to achieve often helps in deciding what, what installation methods to use and, and ought to avoid. Because you can sometimes get away with, with sloppy workmanship in one application, but you really cannot in another application. So it all depends on what the end result needs to be. Something else which is also quite important is making sure um, that the material that you actually get is is suitable for that, not suitable, is, is quality-wise what you think it should be. Now in this case we had a brick, you can see it doesn't look very well. And I suppose sometimes you, you may be manufacturing bricks which, which look like this, so I'm not quite sure. But in any case, so this brick really turned out to be quite, you know, quite bad. And chemical analysis didn't show anything. It showed spot on results, nothing, no problems at all, yet we had a, a serious problem with this. This is just a section through it, so you can see some of the white corundum in there. However, when we did the scanning electron micros microscopy on it, we found that some of the particles, and this is the particle that sort of indicates the problem, so some of the particles for a specific grain size had a huge amount of impurities in it. The rest of the material was okay. The rest of the material was actually above standard. So, so when, when the manufacturer, when he, when he made this brick, he got raw materials from different suppliers and, he, and, and different grain sizes. And, and he mixed them, he checked the chemical analysis, the chemical analysis was okay. But once this, this stuff was mixed, these particles of a specific size reacted seriously with the conditions and started expanding. And so they were the, the culprits in the, in, in, the, in the whole system. So again, be careful of a general chemical analysis. Yes, it could be okay, but it could also be not okay. So what? Quality of material is seldom checked against its intended use. So are the qualities check, quality checks of the manufacturing process is accepted. When most people buy refractory materials, they accept the quality that the manufacturer would have on the bricks. Now, if you're in, 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 in the brick breaking, making business, you would have certain, certain criteria which will allow you to check whether your process is consistent and that you're producing the same stuff every single time and so you would take measurements of certain things in the refractory world for refractory bricks it's most often cold crushing strength and porosity and the bulk density so those are the three things that they said it's simple it's easy to check cheap quickly um, and and it gives you this assurance that your process in the brick making process is okay but that doesn't necessarily mean that that brick is suitable for the application that you want to use it. So as an end user of the, of the bricks, you actually need to test bricks for that specific purpose 
So if we if we go back to the, our first example, if compressive stress strain is an important aspect of the brick, we should test for that. We should not rely on cold crushing data to 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 pass the material or not. We should actually test the bricks according to that uh, standard. Then overall chemistry of material could be inspected, but we've concentrated the periods in specific parts, and, and this is also something that one needs to check. And, um, and I suppose the best way to check it as a final product is just to do a uh, microscopy on it. Microscopies are extremely valuable and sometimes I think underestimated. All right, what's the next part of how to get <coughs> the best out of your line? And I say this is continuous improvement. You will only uh, experience re really you know, the limits of your process and the limits of your materials by looking at what's happening with the material currently in there. Now, in this specific example, we had an arc furnace. And the arc furnace, were, the side walls of this arc furnace were built with a magnesium material. And the run life of it was nine, 9 to 12 months. So, so there was normally a 9 to 12 months sort of period in which uh, it performed okay, and then we had to, 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 to dismantle it and demolish it and do a new lining. And that was sort of set as a standard. And then quite extensive studying was done on trying to find suitable other materials. So this is ways in which you can do this. It's quite aggressive and it's, it's all to do with corrosion. Um, so here we have some cup tests done. And you can see the difference between different materials, how they actually react with the slag. And then also, this is not the, the only thing, then also you would choose the best ones out of this test, go to a rotary slag test, and test it slightly more vigorously to, to get a better idea of, of how the material could perform in, 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 in real life. The problem with the cup test, it's a single test, it only tests the reaction of of the slag with the refractory. It doesn't actually simulate anything about the the brick and and where it's in, installed. And where it's installed, it's also got a thermal shock factor in. So the rotary slag test, you can actually sort of simulate a little bit of the thermal shock as well as uh, a more aggressive nature of, of abrasion and corrosion in it. Then disaster strikes. Okay, why? We never realized that well if the if the walls lasted for nine for nine months or, or a year, we would rip out the old furnace and rebuild it. Okay, now all of a sudden with the new bricks in there, we were getting like potentially we can get about five years life out of it. But shortly after fifteen or sixteen months, we had a failure in the in the tapple area. And, and it was it was the arch over this temple that just collapsed. So the next stage was actually to um, to redesign the arch. So instead of a, just a single layer of arch bricks, we we actually installed two layers of arch bricks in there, and that sort of helped quite a lot in uh, stabilizing that part of the furnace. So you can actually do one thing quite well, and then just run into something else which you haven't actually thought about. And this is why I say uh, continuous improvement is a, a essential. It's an essential requirement. <coughs> and it normally works like this. You've got an original design. Somebody would say, this is my process. This is how I assume the process conditions are going to be. And they design a refractory lining according to the information given at that point in time. Now, that's maybe 50 years ago. There may have been some change in the process, or technology may have changed. But in any case, there is an original design somewhere. From that, the installation was done. The installed lining was uh, exposed to the operating conditions, and you know it quite well. Then at one point, you will have a failure. And tech's always, uh, and he's just sitting here. 
uh, he always tells me that I shouldn't be talking about failure because failure really sounds nasty. But you have some sort of a, a, a time when you cannot use that refractory line anymore, and you and you could most probably call it a loss of the lining or so forth. But the normal way of doing this is just to repair it and put it back into operation. And so this circle will go on and on and on. And you get used to Nine months is the life I'm getting out of my furnace. Two years is the life I'm getting out of my furnace. Whatever it is, you get used to that. You'd budget for that. You would, um, you would have bricks in stock for that. You would know that in two years time. So 15 months down the line, you would start ordering bricks and get your team and so forth. So everything works well. It's a sort of a comfort zone. But, you, but that's where you're going to stay. Unless you analyze what is wrong, what happened during that failure, try to understand what went wrong, redesign it, and then do the repair and go back to the operational part. Now this is where you actually we would actually improve the, the whole system itself. Continuous improvement uh, creates an extra loop, um, which normally costs money. So, as a production or a maintenance manager, you would be faced with, I want to get somebody in to look at this failure. Uh, it's going to cost me this amount of money. Um, what is the benefits of it going to be? I mean, and that's I think where the biggest problem is that the motivation for this justification of this is often quite difficult. And the current situation is a comfort zone which everybody seems to be happy with. So there's a bit of a tug of war situation going on there. You would feel that you could actually increase production or reduce cost of the material per ton or whatever, if you can just get it to the next stage. But it's not always that simple to do that. Just to uh, recap on this, how to get the most out of refractories, be sure about the function of your refractory lining. What is the main purpose of the lining? Ask yourself that question. What do you want to achieve from the lining? In ensure you understand the process and how it would affect the refractory lining. Now this is Often it helps to discuss this with somebody who knows a little bit about refractory because you wouldn't know your process that well. You know the process. You don't know the material. He knows the material. So it's, it's, it's quite good to go into proper discussions about these two aspects with the two parties. And this includes things like thermochemical, which is corrosion, and thermomechanical, which is you know stresses in the, stru in the structure itself. Ensure the quality of the material is test based on the requirements of the material for that specific application. If it's abrasion resistant, test for abrasion resistant. If it's insulation, test insulation. If it's for creep resistance, test creep resistance. Okay. Make use of qualified installers. Be careful of artisans with 30 year plus years experience, for they may have many years of background. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to put down artisans in general, but. There's always a red flag when somebody tells me he's done this for 30 years because it doesn't always mean that that 30 years is, is, is good experience. Um, so try and find somebody who understands, the installer that understands what he needs to achieve in the end of the day is far better than somebody with 30 years of experience. Um, keep the operating conditions as stable as possible and do not assume a minor change in operating conditions will only have a minor change in the factory line. The factories are very sensitive to, I mean, you have seen the differences in um, stress strain and, and that, you know, results of the higher temperatures. You can get the flat line um, at one point and just above that it's still okay. Um, and it's because the refractories are, and, and in, being in the sort of, in the clay industry, You'd appreciate this. So refractory is the same. It's maybe just high temperature rating, but it's got a point where there's just so much melt in there that it just collapses. How about furnaces for the clay industry? Now, I've I've never been on a clay plant or a clay like yourself. I mean, I'm 
we're just over the over the hill there, but I've never actually seen your furnaces. But I'm going to make a few assumptions, and if they are wrong, then please do correct me. <coughs> Aye? Say again? That's big insulating fire brick, isn't it? No, that's actually a factory bricks in there. Yeah, the fire brick. Huh? Fire clay brick. Fire clay Fire, fire clay. But they're the ones that we had sawdust and other things in, just by the size of them, the setting pattern, you see. <laughs> you know, it's like the high temperatures than fire clay bricks, but you know, it's, well, you, it's main killing bricks, but yeah, it's... You were going up to 1500. Yeah, yeah. So I remember the killing things, you had to work on it. <laughs> no, no, no. So, yeah, so, I mean, the, the, this kiln is, uh, is one that is a picture of one in Thailand. Um, but, uh, but most of them are very similar. I mean, Sam Cement. Tunnel kiln is, eh? Is a Sam Cement? Uh, well, yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, you only got somebody to do this bit for yeah, you. Yeah, 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 yeah. <coughs> okay, so the quite first question what is required of a refractory lining? Um, in, in a in, in a in a in a tunnel kiln, for instance, uh, and I've just plotted these two requirements. Now it needs to contain heat for the firing of the clay products, so it needs to keep the heat inside. And I think one of the real needs in today's in today's life is basically to minimise heat loss because because energy is money nowadays, and I think it's more money. I mean, I was in Saudi Arabia just now, and you can fill your your car fuel tank with about seven pounds. Huh? No, it's that expensive, yeah. Um, and they they have more of a problem with water than with than with uh, than with fuel. But I think where we are sitting, we have a lot of issues with um, with trying to minimise heat losses. And obviously, not all heat losses are associated with, with the refractory. But a simple thing like a like a tunnel can actually have quite a lot of places where you can actually lose um, lose heat. So we have our kiln there, one side cold, other side cold, in, out, whatever. We have a little car going through there with the bricks or product on it, it's fired and so forth. We've got cool air coming from this side and it cools the material before it goes out and it heats the material. Uh, we've got sort of hot gases going out of the other side, preheating the material as it goes into the firing zone. And uh, you have a set of burners that creates a nice sort of temperature profile for your inside of the kiln. Um, then we insulate the kiln just to contain the heat. Okay? And by doing this, we can actually reduce the amount of heat losses. So what is important is, <coughs> is these bricks, this insulation that you use should be, should be a really good insulation material. You, you, you'll be looking at not necessarily very hard and tough bricks, but you'll be looking at something with very good insulation properties. Um, energy losses in a kiln uh, can originate in the kiln car, the hot exit gas, the refractory lining, and the product itself. I mean, you heat up a product, you send it out, and it actually gets, it, it goes in cold and it comes out hot. It doesn't come out extremely hot, but it comes out warm. So you do lose a little bit of energy there. Um, what to consider with the refractory lining of such a furnace? Thermal insulation, which is equal to thermal conductivity. It's a reduction of heat transfer between objects in thermal contact or in a range of radioactive. Uh, you can make this number. Now, when you look at thermal conductivity, and this is just uh, something I want to share with you because I think it is important in the industry that you are working in, that if you are looking for, for specific products of thermal conductivity, you should be aware that there are two methods in which they test thermal conductivity and suppliers would use the one that, that benefit them the most. They would use them, okay? Now just to give you some example, uh, example here, the one is the ASTM method, the other one is the British standard. Now we do the British standard we, because we are living in Britain, okay? But a supplier of bricks doesn't, he doesn't care, you know, whether he just wants the best one. Now the difference between them is, and this is actual pictures of the, of, of the units, but the, the difference is that in the one you have heat from the top and the sample and your calorimeter at the bottom. So 
you're actually forcing heat downwards onto your calorie meter. The British mm -hmm. standard says, no, we put the heat underneath, and you know, you know, heat wants to travel up. Go through the sample, and you've got your calorie meter on the top. Although not a big difference, it does make a difference. And in some materials, I think it's been found like almost 20% difference. So be careful of the values that are quoted on data sheets, where it's coming from. Um, my experience with this is that I, not because, not because I, you know, I love Britain, but, but because I think it's just, you know, more sensible to actually do it with the heat at the bottom, um, and, and, and sort of, uh, because, because that seems to be a more logical way of doing it. I've also found that doing calculations, I seem to be closer to real life temperature gradients in the brick lining with the British method, or the values that obtain from the British method, than with the AST method. Uh, however, the differences are not, not that big that you could, uh, that you could be really concerned about. It. The effect is just be, be certain where these values are coming from, that you are actually measuring, if you're measuring two materials, that one is not done according to the British standard, the other one to the AST standard. Um, something I'd like to point out, which I just saw this morning when, and, and this is a very fresh slide, it's actually, um, when I had a look at the Refractors Engineer magazine, March 2012, there was an article, Insulating fabric, maximizing energy savings and ion steel applications through product selection. Very interesting article about the differences in different types of bricks. Now, in con the conclusions of this was that thermal insulation can vary significantly depending on the way the brick was made. So they had bricks made in of the same material, but one in an extrusion process and one in a casting process, and it actually gave quite different results in the end. And we have also found that depending on extrusion, depending on how you turn the brick, you can actually get different uh, thermal conductivities depending on, on which side, side you're actually taking it on. Okay, so in this article, bricks manufacture using casting process compared to an extrusion process provided uh, proof to reduce energy usage by 37 to 38%, which is really a huge amount. I mean, I was surprised to see this number, and I would most probably say, I'm questioning it a little bit, but the point is, you know, don't run away with this value. It is it is based on what they have found and their specific application in the steel industry. So it could be true for for for, for their specific. If you have a furnace already well insulated, I think you struggle to get to 37% uh, reduced uh, energy. But in any case, very interesting. Be careful again. You look at two different bricks from two different suppliers. They are rated very much the same. They look the same. They are made in different ways and they could actually be quite different in terms of their, their value. So do test and do go about the extra mile making sure that you get proper information on thermal conductivity. Manufacturers seldom test materials often. They would test it during the development stages they have quite a lot of data on that available. <clears throat> and then they would do maybe one or two a year, uh, just as a check. Um, it's, it's worthwhile discussing this with the manufacturer, trying to get an idea of how consistent that, um, that value is on. Something very interesting that we've actually done is to use finite element analysis again to calculate the total heat losses of a specific system. Now this was a, a aluminium uh, channel or a channel for for molten aluminium and one of the things are that this is although it seems like a simple system it's got silicon carbide in it and then it's got insulation material here but once you start calculating this and this is just a square sort of box that it sits in. You would find that it's not so easy just doing hand calculating on this. So using 
latest technology in terms of uh, com computer system, you could actually be get a very nice and you know, accurate value on on um, the heat losses through this specific design uh, by changing the material that you put into this insulation material, um, which is not so easy just to get from a simple calculation on one section of it. So if you would, for instance, do you would take a slice through there and you'd say, okay, this is my hot phase, this is my cold phase, and this is the amount of energy that I think I'm losing, and if I use a better insulating material, is it really going to make a big difference? Because you may have areas like this which is not so much affected. So it's always good to just check it um, via a system like this. Other considerations for kiln design, flat roof, arch roof, high and narrow, low and wide, I mean, it all makes differences in terms of how evenly your temperature inside the kilns are, your maintenance schedules, all these type of things. Other part which is quite, and I think this is, I suppose, one of the more important parts is the kiln guard itself. Now what we have with the kiln guard is we have a steel structure with wheels, and we have some sort of uh, mechanism to prevent the uh, heat passing through on the sides here and then we have a platform on which we we actually stack these the product and this needs this obviously needs to be quite a strong a strong system but also what is important in a kiln car is the thermal capacity I mean what you, you actually because you need slightly just to give you a definition for thermal capacity. What you need is you need something that is strong. It's more dense, it can handle um, it, it can handle thermal shock or thermal thermal cycling. Um, it can handle mechanical wear on it because you're actually putting in it needs to be quite strong for, for all the product to be on stacked on top of it. But in any case, for a given substance, the heat capacity of the body is directly proportional to the amount of substance it contains. So a more dense material will retain more heat. So, so it goes into the kiln, absorbs quite a lot of heat. Once it goes out of the kiln, it still contains quite a lot of that heat. And I think this is where quite a lot of your heat is actually going. So the brick, ne brick needs to be strong to withstand mass load on top of it, as well as abrasion resistance, withstand mechanical wear. And if you have a square brick, you obviously have quite a large sort of volume there. If you cut a hole in the bottom, um, then you, you get two things. You reduce the mass of it, so the capacity of it uh, reduces, but you also get slightly a, an improved insulation value on it. Because that's the other part that the kiln car needs to do. It needs to insulate the bottom part of you know, the wheels uh, and the steel structure. Of, of it. So you've, you've got two requirements there actually. One is capacity and the other one is also insulation. So by doing something like this, now you need, just need to be careful of how you actually design that part because because doing it with like a square hole could actually weaken your whole structure. Right, where do I see future developments in terms of kilns? I think um, the biggest potential saving is better utilization of exhaust gas. I mean, exhaust gas are nowadays used for drying of the, the product, pre-eating of product, um, recirculating into the kiln. But it still seems to be the biggest heat loss that that kilns, or not only kiln, not only tunnel kilns, but almost everywhere in the glass industry, they also have the same problem with with exhaust gas, and they're trying to pre the raw material is coming into the kiln, so they, everybody tries to utilize this exhaust gas in, in other applications they have waste heat boilers that tries to reca recapture some of this, uh, this waste heat. And I suppose this is one aspect of, of kilns that, that will still be there for quite some time, is how to, how to capture this, this exit heat better. Um, Burner technology is rapidly improving to operate more efficiently with less carbon dioxide and, uh, and most importantly, NOx's. <coughs> so, 
what I've seen so far is that there seems to be a tendency for people to change their burning systems. Um, and in the glass industry, for instance, they're starting to add pure oxygen to it. Um, it. It all depends on the specific application and how much you know airflow you also need for this for this process. But the other aspect.